Hello, AP Art History. In today's lesson, we are tackling the Renaissance, the High Renaissance to be um, in particular, and also its transition into mannerism. The Renaissance, I think, has become a household term. We have all heard that word before. We know may a, we may know a couple of things about it, but really, how much can we explain the Renaissance? Do we do we really understand contextually what is happening at this time and why the art is um, so famous during this time period? So I want to start you off a little bit by helping you just understand the big picture of the Renaissance. Make sure that you are comprehending how AP is breaking down the Renaissance into um, smaller parts and then what does it mean as a whole. And so to start off, I think it's really important to know that the term Renaissance in its direct translation means rebirth. And that's going to be um, a big clue when we understand what's happening during this time period. So what I've done for you here is I have sorted um, the, the kind of times of the Renaissance, not just the Renaissance, but leading up to the Renaissance and then um, kind of how, how the Renaissance fades out. Um, but this, this is important to understand because this is how AP breaks it up for you. And without understanding the differences, um, I think it can seem a little bit confusing. So I've just um, sorted out some general information for you and kind of put it in a timeline format. So up here at the top, I've put um, some of these eras um, and their you know, general time periods. So we're going to start with Gothic art, then we move into the early Renaissance. Gothic art is from 1140 to 1400. Then early Renaissance goes from about 1400 to 1500. Then we have that time period of the High Renaissance, which is, you know, a short time period between 1495 and 1520. And then the High Renaissance um, kind of morphs into this style called mannerism. Um, but I want you to take note then if you look at the Northern Renaissance, like all, the Northern Renaissance is happening from 1400 to 1600. So that whole time. So all three of these um, eras, early, high, and mannerism are taking place during Northern Renaissance as well. So I, th I think that's an important thing to visualize that um, some of them are concurrent with each other. They're not all totally separated. And there's also like overlapping that occurs. So starting with Gothic art, even though we're talking about the Renaissance, we did discuss how Gothic art was really the bridge between the Dark Ages and the Renaissance. And um, we also said that, you know, the Dark Ages was kind of like that um, medieval time where um, it was just kind of the age of ignorance. Um, and then the Renaissance becomes this, this artistic boom of rebirth. And Gothic art, I feel, is that bridge. What you're going to see in Gothic art is increased in detail and lots of ornamentation. You're also going to see Gothic art started to bring back emotion to artwork, along with um, you know, naturalistic qualities and human qualities. So if we think to those dark ages, where we're dealing with late antiquity, we're dealing with um, romanticism and kind of all those like the Christian art developments. Um, we, we really moved away from any sort of emotion, naturalism. We talked a lot about how the figures became very flat and outlined coloring book style. Um, and that it looked like a regression, you know, almost in like artistic ability. And we talked that it's not a regression. It's not that skill has changed. It's that um, motivation has changed in, in how we want our figures to appear. Um, this was a time period in the Dark Ages of, of you know, really um, bringing Christianity to light and trying to understand, you know, those new traditions of, of faith and, you know, kind of the power of God and the importance of Christ. 
and you know how do we build traditions around that that's what the dark ages were all about you know exploring that glorifying that um it was a very humble time period you know it was a kind of just about being um you know getting into heaven and being pure and being good um and so the art really reflects that um, figures become flat, drapery is, you know, extremely increased, and anything that was kind of related to paganism at all, anything that was related to classical art, whether it be Roman or Greek, was done away with. Because remember, in your early Middle Ages, uh, or in your early medieval times, you're really, you know, uh, revolting against paganism and really trying to promote this Christianity. And so you are creating, um, you know, new idols and new icons and, and a new artistic style. So um, Gothic art was the, was the movement that kind of started to, you know, dabble in that again. So we have um, human qualities. We also, um, we're getting rid of some of that flatness and artwork, both painting and sculpture was working towards um, being more dimensional, whether that be literal three dimension or that be visual dimension, um, moving away from those harsh outlines and, you know, flat colors. Um, but overall, the Gothic art was just really starting to embrace a more grand and majestic essence of art in general. Um, it, it just, you know, for lack of a better terminology, it just became more artistic um, and skillful. And um, anyways, that to me, Gothic art was really the bridge um, to boost the Renaissance. Okay? So when we move into the next period, um, you know, then we have the early Renaissance. But early Renaissance, remember, is happening in, you know, in Italy and beyond. Okay. So most of, of the, the Renaissance credit um, is given to Italy because there were a lot of um, kind of famous artists and a lot of innovations that happened during that time. But remember, it's, it's happening throughout Europe, okay? Um, so starting off with the early Renaissance, what, it's, what the early Renaissance is known for is kind of a period of time where this is where the theories of art were being developed. The innovations, the advancements in painting and architecture, this is where it, they're all happening. Um, it was like this is where the, the years that the work was being put into. Um, and then they usually refer to as the high renaissance. It's kind of like, to me, it's like early renaissance was the, the studies and then high renaissance was like the exhibition, okay? And of course that's not literal, but metaphorically speaking, that's how I kind of um, decipher early renaissance from high renaissance. So in the early renaissance, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of innovations happening. Um, and what was happening in Italy, contextually very important, um, is Italy was broken up into city-states, and I have a map of that on the next slide that we'll look at in a second. But see, these city-states, they were, they were, you know, very strong, kind of independent, independently ruled states, and they were ruled by different families. So a lot of times, you know, you had kind of aristocratic, like, princes and things like that that would rule one of these regions or city-states of Italy, but it, it was so rich with wealth, lots of money. And these city-states, although they were all, you know, Italian, they were very competitive with each other. And the reason why that's important, this like, you know, wealthy competition is what allowed art and artists to flourish. Because this competition that occurred between the city-states um, was, was kind of best played out artistically. And it became like, um, you know, these reputations for who had, you know, the most innovative and beautiful architecture or who had the most amazing frescoes. It literally became a competition from one city-state to the other. 
And so lots of money was being spent on art to kind of glorify their, their cities. And there was a lot of competition amongst, you know, the artists, like what city state was going to um, patron which artist. And these artists were slowly becoming literally celebrities, okay? Prior to the early, prior to the Renaissance, your artists were just kind of seen as skillful people that had a duty. You know, they were either commissioned by um, the church or commissioned by, you know, a noble family. And they just, it was kind of their duty to create artwork specifically, you know, for that, um, for that church or for that home without any sort of artistic integrity at all. Um, it was very strict. There was no, um, you know, artistic expression. It was all just defined by skill. And if you were skillful, you had a job and, and that was it. Nobody cared about your thoughts, your ideas, your innovations. It was just, you know, this is, this is the style. This is how it's done right. And, you know, can you do that? And if you can, then you're hired. Where now it became about talent and specific style. And, oh, this artist, you know, is amazing at, at you know, rendering these figures. But this artist is amazing at, you know, um, creating these landscape frescoes. And, and it became more about, you know, the artist and the artist's style. And that's what really, um, you know, helped with the friendly competition. In terms of architecture, though, um, you know, that, that Gothic art uh, in regards to architecture, remember Italy always kind of rejected it, just thought it was a little bit too much, a little bit on the gaudy side. Um, so in terms of Italian Renaissance architecture, it, it kind of went back to ideal proportions, um, harmonious geometry. It kept the very tall naves from Gothic architecture, but all other details were rejected. You, you didn't have, you know, all the kind of um, dimensional sculptures on the facade. They weren't into the spires. They kept things very simple, very um, geometric. Proportions were ideal. And, um, you know, really the only thing that was pulled from it was some of those S arched windows and really tall naves. But in the early Renaissance, the major artistic innovations that occurred, first of all, was a linear perspective. I mean, it was here that linear perspective was mastered. And because alongside the Renaissance, the Renaissance was mainly a rebirth of art, but it was also a rebirth of science and philosophy and um, politics. So it was, it was just a, a great period of, of human growth and, um, and creativity. So linear perspective be, became very widely used and very popular because, you know, you also have a lot of scholars and philosophers and, you know, artists like Leonardo da Vinci, you know, who was a mathematician, an, an inventor, an artist, you know, you had these, these creative people that were so highly intelligent in, in many different, different realms. And so this, this bond, this kind of bleeding over of, of art and science and math um, was starting to happen. And so things like linear perspective um, is something you're going to see quite often in paintings and frescoes. But also, you know, aside from like the science and math part, you have this, this humanism returns. Um, you have human emotion coming back to those figures. Remember how stoic the figures were for so long? Um, looking back at, you know, early medieval art, um, it, you know, almost kind of reminds you a little bit of like the Sumerians way back in Mesopotamia. But now we, we're coming back to humanism, especially, you know, we talked about um, late Hellenistic Greece and, and that kind of style. Um, we also have now, we're back to glorified nudity. Remember, that's been gone for a while. 
all the heavy, heavy robes and velvet drapery that covered, you know, these like very figures. Well, now we have, um, you know, we're back to nudity and that it's glorified. And again, the reason we're back to nudity is because we're in this age of development where um, human anatomy and physiology is something that is being uh, widely studied and um, kind of, you know, educated on. And so all of this goes together, you know, your, your art, your science, your math, your, your anatomy, your, um, your philosophy, all of that is, is combined into this, you know, just wonderful age of, of rebirth. You're going to have your subject matters um, still mainly very religious based, but you're going to start to see it expand a little bit and you're going to see mythology come back. You're going to see a lot of portraits as well. Um, I mean, a lot of portraits, portraits of, of actual um, people, um, you know, not just Jesus, Mary or, you know, certain saints or disciples, but, you know, actual you know, human people, but you're going to see a little bit of that, like paganism come coming back with that, that mythology. Um, so this is exactly why it's called the Renaissance. Renaissance meaning rebirth, rebirth of what? Rebirth of classical Greco-Roman um, um, styles that you're going to see that those qualities come back. They're going to be modernized, but um, this is this happens a lot in art, and you're going to see it as we continue throughout the year. That um, there's a lot of kind of revitalizations in art movements, where you know we we go through an era and then it, it morphs, and then at some point it kind of comes back to that that era and revisits it, but you know transcends it and changes it at the same time. So all of that's happening in the early Renaissance, you know, all this innovation, all these, all these beautiful changes. And then we have the high Renaissance. The high Renaissance, like I says, really just kind of denotes a period that's seen as like the culmination of the entire Renaissance period. Like I said, to me, metaphorically, it's kind of like the final exhibition or the final art show. Um, again, it flourished only because of its patrons the rich city-state patrons of princes and popes um, is why art was able to flourish. And one of the largest patrons of this time was Pope Julius II. He is the pope that is completely responsible for turning Rome into the artistic center of the world at this time. Um, prior to this, Rome was really a dilapidated, um, town that that had absolutely you know very little significance at all, and through art, Pope Julius knew that it was through art and architecture that he could make this a glorious city and actually make it you know kind of the center of not just you know the art movement but the religious movement, and and he was extremely successful at at it, you know hence the fact that it's still you know the residence of the Pope to this day. All of this was grand until we had the sack of Rome in 1527, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and that was the turning point. That's what kind of ended the Renaissance era and started the Mannerist. Um, during this time in the High Renaissance, you have um, artists, like I said, their reputations have changed, their roles have changed. They've, they've become these, you know, very desired, sought out celebrities. And um, so therefore you see their training has also changed. Um, it's not just, you know, a, um, a custom that's handed down in the family. It was if, if you wanted to be an artist, you had to uh, kind of join an artist guild and you had to, you know, train. And then we also found, saw formations of like formal art academies and you would train for a very, very long time um, to be uh, an independent artist. We have great innovations 
um, such as the canvas that was directly actually um, adopted from the Northern Renaissance artists. So the Italian Renaissance artists are not responsible for um, kind of uh, inventing the canvas, but they definitely adopted it and you know did some of their own things with it, which we'll talk a little bit about when we get into um, Venetian um, Renaissance art. But you have the use of the canvas finally. We have some wonderful new terminologies um, and techniques, art techniques that we will learn about um, during the high Renaissance period, which is um, fumato, chiaroscuro, and glazes. And then in the high Renaissance art, you're gonna see colors are changing. They become much warmer. They're, um, they're filled with kind of like that warm side of the color wheel with reds and oranges and yellows. And then even the cooler sides like the blues and violets, they still, they're still really balanced with um, warmer tones. So you're gonna see some brighter colors, some warmer colors. Instead of all those neutrals that we've been seeing for quite a while in those medieval times where um, you've got a lot of browns, right? And grays and, um, a lot of duller colors that, that came out of that time period. Everything's brightened up quite a bit. Um, you're also gonna see that during the High Renaissance, we are back to those ideal proportions. Remember what that's called? Those canon proportions. Um, we're going to see um, what's called Arcadian settings. And we'll learn more about that as well when we get into Venetian painting um, and then Balanced compositions. Compositions become very balanced. Remember, balance can be about symmetry, everything being equal on the left or the right, or asymmetry, where um, it's it's not equal, but there's still a sense of balance. But balanced compositions are, are very important. Okay, um, you're also going to see a, a little bit of return of that contrapposto stance. Uh, but again, this is a rebirth of those Greco-Roman um, kind of ideals. So as we move forward, um, the High Renaissance ends and then we move into Mannerism. And Mannerism um, is, is marked by an, an event and the, it's the sack of um, Rome in 1527. Now Rome has been sacked many, many, many times. Um, I think like seven or eight times. Um, but this one is specifically the sack of 1527, and um, this this um, event completely pillaged Rome. I mean, just absolutely destroyed it. So all of that, you know, hard work that um, Julius Pope Julius II um, was was working on, and, and you know, glorifying Rome and, and building Rome to be this beautiful place. Uh, it was completely vandaled and pillaged and destroyed and looted. And it became, after that became a period of rebuilding again. Well, at that time, that is when artists kind of took that opportunity where they thought, okay, you know, artistically we'll rebuild, but you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna do things a little bit different this time. And it just wound up being this like opportunity for artistic change yet again. And so what Mannerists did is they discarded some of those conventional um, perspectives. So we talked about the Renaissance being all about this linear perspective. Well, Mannerists kind of, kind of avoided that. They, they discarded that perspective and they were interested in creating compositions differently. If, if there's to only two things that you remember about Mannerism, I want it to be these two things. One, it's all about compositions, compositions that allow your eye to move around it, okay? And two, it's really about the figures. Um, the figures become elongated, purposely kind of distorted. Um, you know, we've lost that whole canon of proportion. We've lost that ideal, um, you know, figure. It's now about do whatever you got to do to the figure, change the figure, shape the figure, mold the figure in order to create these like interesting compositions. That's the two things you need to remember about mannerism. Okay? 
Now, while all that's going on in terms of Renaissance and Mannerism, remember, you've got the rest of Europe um, having their own Renaissance, okay? Um, so Italian Renaissance versus, you know, the remainder of Europe's Renaissance are, are two totally different things. And Northern Renaissance basically means any place outside of Italy, okay? Um, and what's happening there is you have a lot of trading going on and you have a lot of mercantile interests. And so what that has done is, is really stimulated this like innovation um, to, you know, create, create things differently, create art differently in order to um, appeal to that kind of mercantile, um, you know, uh, ability to, to trade and deliver and sell and profit. And so things like the canvas where you can now, you know, instead of just painting frescoes on walls, well, we need to paint on something that is lightweight, mobile. Uh, I can sell it. I can trade it. People can, you know, carry it and move it around. That's how the canvas was um, kind of um, invented. The other reason the canvas was invented is because um, we're paint. They were painting on wood panels, and we, we learned about that in Gothic. Okay using these beautiful oil paints on wood was very, very popular. But over time we realized that wood is known for warping. And so that was becoming an issue. That was becoming a problem for the artwork. And plus wood is also very heavy. So um, this is how canvas was developed to kind of replace wood because wood had problems, but also to be a part of, you know, buying, selling and trading. The other thing that was stimulated by this, um, you know, mercantile uh, civilization was the pr printing. Okay, how as an artist do I make one thing and, you know, profit greatly off of it? Or how as an artist can I make the same thing 40 times and now I can sell that product 40 times? Um, and so the invention of printing was just a huge innovation for this time period. We talked about that during our last um, review session. We talked about wood woodcut. We talked about engraving, um, and we talked about how you know things were printed off of that. Um, so that's just such an amazing, huge um, innovation that is going to continue to develop from here on out. Okay, we're going to see see the evolution of printing throughout the rest of the year. Um, you have an increased interest and desire for art to now be in private homes. Uh, this is this is a big change. You know, before art was really um, kind of restricted to either the wealthy or the church, and outside of that, you really didn't own art. Um, but now we see that becoming more popular, and that's because now that we can make prints of our artwork, well, we don't have to sell one art piece for an enormous amount of money because we can take that one art piece, we can reproduce it and sell it for cheaper. So now you have art that's for the masses. Now you have art that is being displayed and hung and worshipped and cherished in private homes and private homes of all social statuses not just for the elite anymore, for them to like, you know, lavishly kind of show off their wealth. Um, so it's it's really taking on a, a completely new um, standard uh, and it's, it's definitely changing uh, its reputation. Okay, another thing that is happening during this time that is huge for the entire Renaissance, whether it's Northern or Italian Renaissance, Guys, we have the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation going on. We have Protestant versus Catholic. Um, so up in the Northern Renaissance area, those, those um, countries that kind of, you know, joined into Christianity a little bit later, like Germany and um, kind of those like Eastern European um, states, they, they are responsible for the the Reformation. Um, and, and then Italy 
you know, pretty much had a response to the Reformation. And basically Christianity split into, into two, and that became your Protestant and your Catholic. And the Italian Christians, you know, they remained Catholic. And then, um, you know, everyone else pretty much became Protestant. So you have this division of Christianity. The, Protest the Protestants, um, during the Reformation, they started to um, reject what was happening in Italy because Italy was really kind of glorifying the, rel the religion and religious practice. And make a long story short, they were, they were taxing people, um, basically having them pay their way into heaven. And it was um, Luther who believed that, you know, that was wrong and that, you know, I shouldn't have to pay my way into heaven and I shouldn't not be, be taxed for that. And so he's the one that started the Reformation and started to preach that, you know, I can worship God anywhere. It doesn't have to be in the church. I don't have to pay money for that. So he kind of just started this revolution that that really you know, a lot of people agreed with, and they started to reject, you know, where the route that Christianity was going, that the route that kind of Italy and, and the popes were taking Christianity. And part of that is also starting to reject the art movement that was happening in um, Italian Renaissance art, because we, you have so much um, art that's being spent and, and being created um, that is, you know, about representations of the Bible and Jesus and Mary and, and, and you know, all these basically icons and, and the Reformation said, you know what, we're going to, we're going to reject that. Like, we don't, we don't need to have all of these icons again. And they kind of went back to that, I like, iconoclastic way, you know, of like rejecting uh, religious icons. And so when you have that happening in this northern um, Renaissance area, what you have happening is artists, you know, they're still growing and they're still flourishing. But it's like, well, if, if we're kind of rejecting, you know, religious icons, well, what do we paint? What do we draw? What do we sculpt? And so that's why in northern Renaissance, you see totally different subject matters of artwork developing. You see genre paintings. And we went over that in um, our Northern Renaissance presentation where, you know, we have hunters in the snow and we have, you know, Rembrandt, um, you know, as a, a self-portrait. And we have, you know, artwork that is now taking on completely different subject matters and, and that are non-religious at all. And so this is what grows and develops when you're part of an area that's now rejecting those religious icons, okay? Where in Italy, the exact opposite is happening. So with the Counter-Reformation, what you have is Italy saying, hey, we're, we are losing our followers and I know, I know a great way to like win them back over and reel them back in. We're gonna make Catholicism, we're going to make our type of Christianity just be so glorious and mouth-watering, and we're going to entice them with art, and we're going to win them back. And that was that was genuinely the mentality that was happening in Italy with Catholicism. And so you have two totally separate things going on here. You know, you have the group of Protestants that are is kind of rejecting all of that and exploring art differently. But then you have the Catholics and the Italians that are totally, fully embracing it and saying, hey, let's make religious art more beautiful than ever. And so that is contextually what is happening during this Renaissance time. I've given you a map here to just kind of show you these Italian city-states. So this is Italy, of course, the boot, and then it's divided up into all of these city states so you have okay here's rome this is the papal state and you know florence um 
Venice is, you know, where Venetian painting was happening that we'll be talking about. But all of these city-states, you know, were, were governed by different families, princes and popes, and they were in competition with each other all the time. And you kind of hear them talk competitively, like, oh, well, in Florence, they, you know, they're doing this. And, and um, they kind of all had these like different styles. And then they, they had these different artists that um, they would kind of um, be able to, you know, patron to, to come and, and work for them and, and, you know, build architectural um, uh, construction and, and paint frescoes and, and do all this glorious work to make their city state the best city state possible. So we went over a lot of this contextual information, so I'm not going to go over it again, but here it is in written form. This will really help you. One thing that we didn't um, go over is just that, um, you know, after, after the Reformation and then the Counter-Reformation, um, you're going to hear the term Jesuits. And so um, that after, with the Counter-Reformation, you kind of had this new grouping of, of priests called the Jesuit priests. And they're the ones that initiated this Counter-Reformation of kind of glorifying um, art and to use it as a tool to kind of get people back into Catholicism, make it enticing again, almost use you know it as an advertisement. Um, so you you will probably hear the term Jesuit, and that's what that means. Um, these were those three terms that we talked about before about um, some technical innovations uh, for Renaissance painting, and it's important to know these terms, but. Um, you know, we already talked about canvases being a huge innovation, um, but we talked about um, fumato, chiaroscuro, and glazes. So fumato was something that was created by Leonardo da Vinci. It was part of his style. And what, what it means is it's an effect that when he's painting his forms and rendering them, rendering means, you know, f finishing them, putting like finishing touches on them, um, he would he would paint in such a way that kept everything really kind of soft, almost misty looking. You know, you didn't have those like sharp edges. We definitely don't have those outlines anymore um, like we did with like Byzantine art. Um, but it was, it was almost as if, you know, when you got really close to the figures, they almost looked like a little bit blurry. But that's because when you stand away from them, it creates just this like very naturalistic softness. Um, and so that is called fumato, again, created by Leonardo da Vinci. And the Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa is a great example of how he almost used that, that kind of blurry effect um, in, in his paintings. Um, Chiaroscuro is a, a soft transition of gradations of color. So that's your values. Okay. So your gradations are your values. So, you know, from white to light gray to medium gray to dark gray to gray. Okay. Those are gradations. Um, or, you know, any, any color, light blue, you know, medium blue, dark blue, deep blue. Okay. And when you blend that very subtly, okay, then you get much more dramatic effects and that comes also from how light hits that object so chiaroscuro really is about lighting and how does light change color in a painting and if you ever took a painting class or a color theory then you would know it changes it dramatically so um, artists started using dramatic lighting to create these these effects um, of of transitions of values and there's a um, example right down here where you can see you know there's a lot of dark going on okay because we have dramatic lighting almost like a spotlight okay or candlelight that's that's something um, that you're gonna see um, just 
take off big time when we get into Baroque art, which is next. But you can see that you have these subtle transitions of gradations. I mean, look at this whole painting, really, aside from, you know, the skin and the beard is really just different tones of like reds and maroons and, you know, browns and blacks, like that's it. Um, but you have so many different gradations and values because of the light that gives you that chiaroscuro effect. And then glazing, glazing is something that um, Venetian artists um, invented because they, um, you know, we're painting with this beautiful oil paint now that, you know, the um, Gothic art introduced us to. But then, um, especially um, um, Titan, who was uh, one of our Venetian painters, he realized that if you put this clear glaze over top of your oil paint, not only will it help seal it, but it'll brighten everything up tremendously. Um, and so if you can just imagine almost like a clear, you know, like polyurethane that goes over all of these colors and just brightens everything up immensely. So my screen has frozen up on us. All right. Hopefully it's back in business now. Okay. All right. So we have learned a lot about um, contextual information regarding the Renaissance. We learned about um, the transition into the Renaissance and little bit of the transition out of the Renaissance. So now let's look at some Renaissance art, okay? This is image number 73 in your book. It is by Leonardo da Vinci. It's titled The Last Supper. Again, I think that this is a household painting. Everybody, I feel, at some point in their life has seen an image of this and probably even knows the title. It is from 1494. Um, took about four years to paint. Um, it is oil and tempera, um, but it is a fresco, okay? Um, it's 15 by 29 feet, and I don't think people realize how big The Last Supper really is. Um, what I have down here is an actual um, picture of the Last Supper in its um, environment, and so you can see how large it is. It's the entire width of that wall of that space. Uh, you can see it's quite large. So this painting, like this fresco, like um, most of them, um, was commissioned, and it was commissioned by the um, Forza of Milan for the dining hall of a Dominican abbey. And um, this is definitely a relationship between the friars that, you know, eat within this dining hall at this abbey and the biblical meal that is portrayed here in the Last Supper. Um, it's the only um, Leonardo work remaining in situ. And what that means is um, it's, it's the only remaining work of Leonardo da Vinci that still remains in its original place. Now, it has been restored a million times because this building has gone through uh, quite a bit over the years. I mean, I think it's gone through like bombings and um, rebuilding and I mean, just tons of stuff. But there's always been enough of this fresco left to be kind of um, retouched. And um, so it, it is the only Leonardo da Vinci piece that we still have in its original setting. Um, so <clears throat> if you ever want to see the Last Supper, you actually have to go to this abbey to see it. It's not that it's, you know, belongs to a, a museum now and, and is an exhibition somewhere. So what we have here is beautiful linear perspective, like at its best. Um, you can see that there is a center um, point all of the lines architecturally from the ceilings to the windows. 
you know, all kind of come to a center vanishing point that we know happens out beyond that window. But at the same time, as our eyes are drawn to that vanishing point, what, what are we left with right there in the center, but Jesus himself. So he also becomes the emphasis and the focal point of the artwork. Um, we have groupings. We have a very beautiful, symmetrically balanced, um, horizontal piece of artwork where what is on the left is very balanced to what is on the right. And we have that nice kind of center focal point, but we also have um, our subject matter in groupings and the the what's in groupings are the apostles um, and they are in groupings of three with Jesus being in the center um, and then we also have the windows behind Jesus that is back lighting okay bringing in the back lighting um, which signifies the Holy Trinity now interestingly enough what do you notice is missing um, from Jesus's portrait. I'm wondering if you're noticing and thinking about, you know, early medieval art, thinking about that Byzantine art and all those, you know, portraits of Jesus. What did he have in those pieces of art that he does not have here? And if you answered um, either, you know, his aura or his halo, um, then you were correct because in Renaissance artwork, um, you're going to see that that has been kind of taken away. Um, it really kind of started in Gothic art uh, because, you know, again, we're, you know, looking, looking, getting back to that human factor, getting back to that humanitarian factor, you know, going back to human emotions. And so a lot of that um, kind of divine symbolism has been removed from Jesus um, continuing through the Renaissance, okay? But even though that's gone, um, we still have these windows that kind of backlight him and, you know, still give a sense of illumination, um, but represent the Holy Trinity. Um. We have Leonardo here using, you know, experimental combination of paints. That's why you have oil and tempera together. Um, he's just trying to get different effects and the different paints kind of, you know, work towards those uh, effects differently. Um, but you can see that we have wonderful chiaroscuro happening here. Um, and we also have that beautiful kind of blurriness of figures opposed to really, you know, crisp edges and, and flat, flat color. Um, the problem is though that, um, you know, these paints definitely did not last a lifetime on the wall and has peeled off quite a bit, but luckily has been restored over and over. Um, <clears throat> basically this scene, okay, if you are unaware, it depicts the, you know, biblical moment that Jesus confesses and says, you know, one of you is going to betray me. So it's capturing that moment. It's capturing all of the apostles' reactions when he proclaims that. And each apostle has um, its own, you know, reaction of surprise or anger, denial, um, suspicion. There's a lot of like, you know, finger pointing or a lot of, you know, hand raising, like it's not me. Um, so it's really kind of about capturing that moment and, um, you know, really looking at all of the apostles and how they react. Um, if you're unaware, though, that it is Judas right here who kind of is leaning back but clutching in his hand is a bag of gold coins and um, on the next page just for your levels of curiosity i've included um you probably you probably won't know need to know this for ap art history i mean you will definitely need to be able to identify jesus and probably judas but um all of the other apostles i, I can't imagine you'll you'll ever need to identify but just for your own interest um these are the um 12 apostles. 
Our next image is number 76 from our book. It is painted by Raphael and it is titled The School of Athens. Um, it was commissioned in 1509 and completed in 1511. It is a fresco. It is in the um, Apostolic Palace within the Vatican City of Italy. Um, it is 16 by 25 feet. This up here, this image is, you know, the image of the School of Athens, but down here, I just kind of wanted to show you how it looks in the space in the room that it was um, painted in. Um, it's just a beautifully glorified, decorated space. Um, but Raphael is responsible for all the frescoes within this room. Um, but this, um, this was actually the library. And he, like I said, painted you know, all the frescoes in this room, but we are only responsible for knowing this wall. Um, that is the School of Athens. So this was commissioned by Pope Julius II. And Pope Julius II, this is where that like um, competitiveness really comes into play but between artists. But Pope Julius II is known for hiring Michelangelo to do um, most of the artistic endeavors. And he was probably the most, you know, celebrity of the artists during that time period, the most sought out and the most wanted. Um, and then, you know, you had some of his, you know, um, runner ups, if you would, and, and Raphael was was one of them, but Raphael could never quite get um, to that level of, of Michelangelo. And there was a lot of animosity um, between these competitive artists. Um, but anyways, um, Pope Julius II did commission him to decorate the library um, while, you know, Michelangelo um, was commissioned to do the Sistine Chapel. So it really kind of frustrated Raphael. You know, Raphael wanted the, the big ticket item um, and was kind of frustrated that he got the library. Um, the painting originally was titled Philosophy because the Pope's um, philosophy books were meant to be housed in the shelving below. So down here below there was shelving that housed, um, was supposed to house all of his books on philosophy. So originally that was the title of this piece, but you'll also understand in, from content, when we get into content, um, its connection to philosophy as well. Um, <clears throat> this, this painting is a wonderful display that illustrates the vastness and the variety of the Papal Library. And that comes from a lot of the figures that are painted within this um, piece. You have um, an open and clear light uniformly spread throughout the whole composition. So you just have this beautiful, wonderful composition of balance, you know, from the left side to the right side. Again, you have the most amazing example of linear perspective. You know, everything, it, it's, when I say linear perspective, what I want you to translate that to in your head is like mathematical um, acuteness. You know, it's not just an artist like having the ability to kind of create, you know, a good painting and create the illusion of, of depth. No, this is like mathematically correct. Everything is is mapped out, you know, almost like a blueprint, and then and then painted on. Um, so this is just a beautiful example again of linear perspective. Um, you have a lot of um, monumentality of forms that are, and when I you know talk about this beautiful architectural form that is in parallel to the greatness of all the figures that are represented. Um, we have figures such as Plato and Aristotle and a lot of those, you know, return to, you know, Greek philosophy and that Greco-Roman um, antiquity and um, kind of paying homage to those you know, innovative thinkers and inventors. Um, <clears throat> and that's what this um, mural, this fresco is really representing. 
Um, the figures um, are in gesture to indicate that they are in philosophical thought. So uh, on the next page, I have I have it you know larger so you can see detail. But all of the figures are engaged in some sort of um, thinking or philosophical thought or like deep sort of you know conversation with each other or um, some sort of um, um, debate with each other. Um, but, you know, everybody is, is actively thinking. Um, so we have here Raphael, it was known to kind of be a little bit, be a little bit testy and a little bit sneaky. And um, he was, it's, it's under theory that he included within this painting um, images of himself, images of Michelangelo, um, images of the Pope's architect, um, and just kind of including these groupings, you know, within this, um, this fresco of like, you know, all the greats. Um, and we also do know that Raphael definitely structured his um, composition of this painting based off of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. And if you can really see the influence here because you have this strong center horizontal, um, you know, composition with all of the linear perspective, you know, coming from every angle um, going right down the middle, which brings us to our focal point of our center figures of Plato and, and um, Aristotle. So it's it's definitely mirrored off of the Last Supper. And then this is just a close up, um, so you can see some of those figures and those details of everybody, you know, thinking and reading and and conversing um, and discussing. Um, so it's, it's just like an, an active, you know, learning moment. But when I post the, um, the slides, this is a quick little video that will give you a lot more insight to individual characters, uh, which I think is important to understand for the School of Athens. Okay, now we're going to move on to the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel has multiple images. So the Sistine Chapel is a chapel in the Vatican City. Um, if you were, you know, unaware, this is where um, the Pope resides. And this is uh, an image of some of its exterior, which we do not need to know uh, anything about the structure itself. This is not um, an architectural piece. This is more about the frescoes inside. Okay, the Sistine Chapel, um, what we're going to be looking at is um, images from the ceiling, and then we will be um, looking at the altar wall. So this is just kind of a flat depiction of the ceiling, but then this kind of, this image shows you a little bit about what the actual chapel looks like. I hope that you recognize that tall nave with those clerestory lights, um, you know, a little bit of that, that Gothic influence. And then the, the, the uh, ceiling is um, completely painted, the whole entire thing. And then back here, this, this rounded wall, this is, um, this is the altar wall. I've given you a map, which again, for AP, you, you do not need to know all of the depictions in the ceiling. So this is a map of, of the ceiling and um, kind of the groupings or the categories of the stories that are being depicted. So the ones that are in blue here on the side walls, um, let me move this for you. These are, um, depictions of the ancestors of Jesus. The ones that are in green, okay, are the stories of Noah. The ones that are in um, chartreuse are the creation and downfall of Adam and Eve. Then the cream colored ones, you have um, depictions of the, from the um, story of the creation. And then 
in these um, pink and peach colors. You have prophets and you have sibyls. And of all of these um, stories, we're really only responsible for knowing about two of them. We'll be looking at the Delphic Sibyl and we'll be looking at the Great Flood. So overall for your images, number 75, you're gonna to have to know about the Sistine Chapel ceiling and altar in general, okay? So in general, the ceiling was um, commissioned in 1536 and was finally completed in 1541. The altar was um, from 1508 to 1512, okay? Um, that both of them were painted by Michelangelo. Um, it is fresco, and again, located in Vatican City, Italy. So the Sistine Chapel was erected, though, in 1472 and painted by um, Quattrocento masters, including Botticelli, Perugio, um, as well as Michelangelo's teacher, um, Gerlandio, and they're they're the four that kind of you know started the decorations of the um sistine chapel but then as time went on and pope julius ii became um pope then then um he kind of had it, it had it redone um it the function of this building is not for public use this is the chapel where popes are elected um, so this is not open to the um, public. This is not, I mean, it's open to the public as a museum, but it's not uh, open to the public for practice or worship. Um, it is Michelangelo who designed it, and he chose a very complicated arrangement of figures for the ceiling, um, kind of broadly illustrating the first few chapters within Genesis. Um, but he kind of merged together both Old Testament figures and um, kind of old antique classical figures like Sibyls. Um, there are 300 figures on the ceiling alone, and none of them are in the same uh, pose. So they're all completely individualized and dynamic in its own way. Um, this definitely marks Michelangelo's lifelong preoccupation with the male nude in motion. So again, this goes back to, to the Renaissance and the age of rebirth and how, um, you know, it was, it was also just the age of development, not just artistically, but um, anatomy, science, physiology, all of that kind of merged together. Um, this is an enormous variety of expression, and all of the stories are divided by these um, cornices, but those cornices are painted, and I think that's something that people don't quite understand. So these um, architectural features that divide up the ceiling into sections called cornices, those, those are not, um, arch you know, three-dimensional architectural features they are painted on okay and again that kind of goes back to that classical fresco you know roman um roman fresco where they're doing a lot of the you know kind of pompeian style of you know painting frescoes that are meant to look like for their architecture so again it's a revival of that um, many figures are done for artistic expression more than enhancing the narrative. So the narrative is there, absolutely, but it is secondary. Um, it's more so committed to the art, committed to the design of the competition, committed to the beauty of the figures, more than it is the commitment to the story and um, kind of to the integrity of of the Bible, okay? You will also see a ton of acorns that are um, repeated motifs throughout the ceiling, and that's because that um, was inspired by and represents the crest 
of the patron, who again is Pope Julius II. Now, the same number, 75, okay, we have multiple images for 75. So you have, you know, the Sistine um, Chapel ceiling. Now we have specifically um, the Delphic Sibyl. This was, again, 1508 to 1512. Um, this is one of the five Sibyls on the ceiling. And uh, a Sibyl is basically just like a female prophet. And again, when we look at it, you can see that that classical um, style, that Greco-Roman figure um, that you know is very like broad and muscular and ideal, and you know everything is chiseled. And again, that's that study of of physiology and anatomy. But um, the the um, this is definitely part of that Greco-Roman figure who the Christians felt um, foretold the coming of Christ. That's what the Sibyl represents to them. Um, she wears that Greek style turban. So, uh, you know, over her head, that wrapping with all that drapery, um, she's turning her head as if listening, you know, listening to that, that, um, that foretelling, you know, um, because since she is a prophet, she's, got that look of concentration in her face. Um, you can see that her expression holds a little bit of fear and sorrow. Even though she's sitting, you can see that there's that beautiful like contrapposto of the body where you have that, that twisting. You have one arm and one leg that is relaxed, but you have one arm and one leg that is, you know, in action or stiff or um, you know, firmer than the other. Um, she holds the scroll that is containing her prophecy. And what we have here is that beautiful blend, that combination of Christian, religious, but also some of that pagan um, mythological imagery. So, you know, the Renaissance has, has just kind of brought that back, you know, after paganism, anything, you know, to do with um, the pagan history was just completely rejected for so long. And the Renaissance was able to kind of bring that back in and, and kind of marry both of these worlds a little bit. Number 75 also depicts um, the flood from the Sistine ceiling by Michelangelo. This is the story of Noah and his family's escape from the rising flood waters. Again, a story um, in Genesis. We have a few remaining survivors from this depiction that are clinging to mountaintops over here. Um, and, you know, we, it, we just, we see that human factor, right? We see that emotion, that pain, um, that, that kind of troublesome, um, you know, situation that has real human effect. Here we have a man carrying his drowned son to safety, but will only meet his son's fate. We have over 60 figures that are in a somewhat crowded composition, even though they're, they're kind of sorted and separated into um, groupings. The groupings themselves are very crowded. Um, you definitely have that that sculptural kind of feel of that classical figure, even though this is you know a painting. The figures appear to be very three dimensional. Um, you you're, we're back to that classic nude. That you know nudity is not shameful. It's not debasement. It's actually beautiful. Um, and you have that you know again that ideal figure where. Everybody is, you know, very strong and muscular um, and has, you know, that kind of classic physique. The, um, the arc in the background back here is the only kind of safe haven where um, these are the only people that, you know, do not appear to be in fear or suffering. Um, the entire composition itself is an asymmetrical. So this is a great example of how things are balanced where you know the weight of the left feels similar to the weight of the right but it is uneven okay it's not it's not equally distributed and then 
that's all we have for the ceiling, but then the last image of number 75 is the Last Judgment, which is the um, fresco that is behind the altar. So this is the altar piece. And um, in contrast to the ceiling, though, it's not divided up. So it's just one large space. And again, we have groupings of figures. Um, we also kind of have a compositional arrangement of um, horizontal rows. And we can see in this, um, in this fresco, really some of that mannerism is, is starting to show um, because what we care about more here is how the figures fit into the composition. And sometimes that means you have to compromise the integrity of the figure um, in order to make it fit in its place, you know, kind of like a puzzle piece. And mannerism really, you know, is okay with that, is okay with exploring that. You have these four bands, horizontal bands, that represent kind of the, the different levels of um, the Last Judgment. And so at the bottom, of course, we have the dead that are rising on the left. Um, and over here, we have the mouth to hell on the right. And then um, the second level right here is the, the ones that have died but are ascending, okay? And, um, and then the third level, we have those that are um, rising to heaven and they begin to gather around Jesus. And that's where, you know, their judgment will take place. And then um, because what we have, oh, well, I didn't explain that very well. I'm so sorry. So on the second level, you have the ascending, right, coming up then they're going through their judgment on the third row. And then the ones that don't get to continue upward, then they're descending over here on the right. So it's kind of like this big kind of circular format, which is part of what that mannerism is about, you know, like making your eye move around the composition. And then those who, you know, make it past judgment, then they get to go up to the very top, um, to the heavens where you have angels, um, carrying the cross and the column and instruments that were used at Christ's death and and um, other people who get to stay up here and, and surround Jesus. Um, of course, Christ is in the center. He gestures kind of defiantly with his right hand in a very complex pose. I mean, you can definitely tell that he is the one in power. Um, justice is delivered. The good rise and the evil will fall. Um, this down here in the lower right-hand corner where you have the mouth of hell, this is definitely inspired by Dante's Inferno. And um, we have St. Saint Barth Saint Bartholomew's face is modeled um, on a contemporary critic. So this um, right here. So we have here um, St. Bartholomew that was modeled on a contemporary critic and um, the uh, he had made an oblique remark about critics who skin him alive with their criticisms, he being Michelangelo. So he's basically um, talking about how the critics, um, you know, basically give him a, a, a bad um, critique on artwork and when they do that they basically skin him alive so they so he has um, added himself into this painting and has put the his face on um, the on this critic um, and I thought I had a better picture of it I do right here here it is so this is um, being the you know being skinned alive kind of perception, which is, is pretty brutal, um, but that's what that is supposed to represent. Here's just a close-up of Jesus. You can see all that, you know, human anatomy and composition, um, and then here you have the mouths of hell. Um, again, we talked about a spiraling composition um, that, you know, kind of is 
reaction against the high renaissance harmony of the ceiling you know the ceiling is is very structured and organized and separated and divided where this is a little bit more of like in a chaotic state but not only does that represent kind of the the concept of the last judgment but it also reflects contextually what's going on at the time which is you know the the separation of christianity with the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, that there, there kind of is a lot of chaos going on at that time. Okay, here's our image for um, Venetian High Renaissance painting, and this is by um, Titan, and it's called the Venus of Urbino. It's from 1538. We're looking at oil paint on canvas, and remember, um, he was famous for putting a clear glaze over his paintings to really help um, illuminate and brighten up the oil paints. Um, but what is most significant about this painting is the way that the figure um, was painted. It really set the stage for um, all kind of reclining nudes um, paintings. Um, this is really the, um, the start of it and the Venetians were wonderful at um, moving away from that classical figure where you have that really kind of defined, muscular, um, kind of idealistic um, body form and kind of softening everything up, um, making it very atmospheric, gentle, soft, sensuous, um, having a lot of um, natural curves, you know, getting rid of that like kind of brave, heroic look and being very much more um, relaxed and calming to kind of just show like the natural beauty of the world. Um, the other vocabulary word that we talked about was that um, Arcadian. And this is a great example of the um, Arcadian landscape, which is out here in the um, background through the window. Um, these types of like off in the distance countryside landscapes was quite often used um, in Venetian painting. And then you're going to see that trend continue um, where it just kind of gives that uh, idealistic and very romantic setting uh, for many uh, paintings. Um, even though she's called Venus of Urbino, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that she was Venus or been a Venus, um, but you know, they really do believe that she was a lover or prostitute. Um, the patron um, was was Gildebaldo del Rover of Urbino, and this was probably um, maybe one of his lovers. Um, the skin is so sensually toned, and it has that kind of really soft edging. Notice that you know you kind of have the shadows around the curvature of the body, which makes it very three dimensional and kind of stand out from um, the rest of the painting. You have a little bit of that da Vinci kind of fuzziness to it. Um, what's also very interesting is you have um, the subject matter, you know, completely reclined and, and in that very sensual nude position, but she is um, making direct eye contact with you, the viewer, um, as if, you know, there's, uh, nothing to do with modesty here, that um, she's very confident and very comfortable. Um, it's a pretty complex spatial environment. The figure is very forward in the picture plane, um, making the depth of the room seem pretty far. And you can see in the background, you have um, you know, the servants that are pushed way back, but that's still not, that's still just the middle ground. Um, so the separation from the foreground to the middle ground is actually, you know, very vast. And then out behind the windows is where you have your um, background. Um, there's a lot of patterning throughout the uh, painting, you know, in the textiles and the carpet, the uh, carpets and then the um, 
textiles hanging on the wall and the curtains. And um, you'll see a continuous motif, a floral motif, um, specifically of like kind of roses that's carried um, throughout the work. You are going to see that, um, you know, heavy lighting here where you have your um, your deeper values and your kind of lighter um, tones. And that's going to become, you know, extremely focused and popular once we move into Baroque art where you have this like high contrast of color. Um, it's a pretty limited color palette, you know, sticking with just um, a few very deep tones they're still very very warm tones but they're they're deep deep tones and we know that there's a lot of symbolism that also um continues to um you know be explored during this renaissance period um and again we have the dog you know laying on the bed that is a symbol of faithfulness and um but ultimately what's important to remember is that this really became the standard for that reclining nude and you're going to see this pose specifically um, being reinterpreted over and over again okay moving into mannerist painting um, this is your information that kind of gives some characteristics to that mannerist painting that we've already gone over in the very beginning so i'm going to just allow you to use this slide to help um, fill in your graphic notes for mannerist painting um, but this is our image um, it's number 78 it's called the entombment of christ and it's by, um, by jacopo da pontormo from 1525 to 1528. And this is just the most, you know, ideal example of, of Mannerist painting. And I really, really enjoy Mannerist style. Um, it's such a break from tradition. And, you know, even though the Renaissance was so innovative in very many ways, remember, it was a rebirth. It was a kind of revitalization and revisit of the you know greco-roman kind of artistic trends and i feel like mannerism is when um, art really starts to change and it really does become more about um, the artists and their personal style and um, artists begin to have a lot more freedom with how um, they symbolize and, and how they interpret their figures and their forms and their subject matters. Um, so what you can see here, remember we talked about composition. Composition is huge for mannerist painting. And the goal of a mannerist composition is to arrange the subject matter so that there's a flow, okay? We talked about that a little bit in the Last Judgment within the Sistine Chapel, um, on the altar wall. And, and even though it's a huge composition and there's kind of, you know, um, four um, horizontal rows of organization, at the same time, there's also that kind of, um, you know, circular flow from, you know, the, um, the ascending, um, you know, people up to heaven and then the descending, you know, back down to hell. Um, so you kind of have that circular visual flow. But this is a perfect example of what Manners compositions look like. Um, it's not about linear perspective anymore. They kind of rejected that. They didn't want that precision, that, that mathematical approach. They wanted it to be a little bit more romantic and um, emotional. And they really wanted to create a pathway for your eye. So this is a great example of composition, but it's also a wonderful example of the distortion, the purposeful distortion of figures. And if you look closely, like especially this figure down here at the bottom, and, and if you look at, you know, if you think about that canon of proportion, right, and how this is definitely not an example of canon of proportion, um, you can see like the all of the ratios for the body is completely off. You have a really oddly elongated torso, you know, very shortened legs, 
very long neck, small head. So, okay, way off. But what the purpose is, is not, okay, you know, rep representing the human figure in its, you know, kind of pristine natural way, but just making it fit in the composition, making it all flow. And if that means that you have to um, distort the figure to make that happen, like that's totally okay. I mean, even Jesus himself, you know, has a very elongated torso. And if you look at the length of his arm compared to his torso, you can tell that the proportions are incorrect. The other thing is that, um, the body is, you know, definitely twisted and turned and crouched and bent in ways that are just totally unnaturalistic. I mean, different from like a contrapasto. I mean, we've talked about contrapasto and how that's not really a very natural stance and it's actually, you know, difficult to do and uncomfortable. But this is just plain impossible. This is just plain, um, you know, we by looking at it, we know that, oh, our our body does not bend that way. Um, but it didn't matter. It was really all about fitting your um, content in together in, in a specific composition. The other thing that this is a great example of is the Mannerist really um, worked with brighter um, shades. So you're going to see a lot more kind of um, pinks and whites, um, baby blues, um, brighter, lighter tones, kind of moving into a little bit more pastels um, is a color palette for that manner of style. Um, so like we said, we have the elongation of bodies, we have high keyed colors, we have no ground lines for many of the figures. So a lot of these just look like they're floating. You look at the people that are kind of in the background and you're like, well, what are they standing on? You know, what is what is this lady up here crouching on? You know, so it, it doesn't really make sense, but it's this is this is the arrangement that they're going for. Um, you have hands that are disembodied. You have very andro androgynous looking figures where it, it doesn't matter if you can tell, you know, their specific gender. Um, you have, you don't have that, that, you know, weeping feeling like you did kind of with the Gothic, um, you know, that human emotion, but you have this like feeling of, of yearning. Um, the bodies are very linear. They're, they are elongated and they, you know, have more of a vertical sense to them. Um, and again, it's that anti-classical composition. Now for the Mannerist architecture, um, this is image number 82, and um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time here at all because you have two images. So the architecture itself is um, the Jesu church, and then inside the Jesu church is the um, the triumph in the name of Jesus. It's a ceiling painting, and this is going to be covered um, in a different um, screencast, so we're not going to cover it now. Um, but the exterior here, the facade of this church, um, is falls under Mannerist architecture, and really what it does is it, it, it goes back to drawing, you know, on a wealth of antique elements, but with a very playful type of um, reuse. So you're gonna have some of those classical elements where you have your columns, um, you're gonna have these pediments and stuff, but the organization of it all, the ratios of it, how it's all put together is um, very playful and, and engaging um, and it kind of interlocks classical forms, but but makes you kind of ponder the significance of ancient architectures um, during the Renaissance time. Um, so it's, again, you know, a lot like with the Renaissance, is it, it's a modern spin on some classical elements, okay? But for um, filling out your graphic notes specifically um, on this church, um, you're going to use this, this link down here, 
and um, use that information to fill out your image organizer. And then again, for the triumph uh, in the name of Jesus, this absolutely amazing, beautiful, wonderful um, ceiling fresco that will be, we will be covering that in a later screencast because that kind of falls um, actually under a different era. So I hope this was helpful um, deciphering the different um, eras of the Renaissance, the purpose of the Renaissance, and why it's such a significant movement, movement artistically and historically.